I am on mute. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, if I seem a little bit frazzled, it's because I'm in the middle of a radio show. I hopped off just to uh, to kind of get my video started here. Just to kind of say hello, peek my head in. Um, it's, it's good to be with here with everyone today. Um, for me, to be a member of the American Lung Association here in San Diego is a real honor. And it's important to me and my family. When I was a young kid, I was diagnosed with asthma, um, and it was, uh, it was what I thought was going to be life-changing for me, but little did I know that my father was also battling asthma at the same time. Um, I had seen him use an inhaler, but I didn't quite put it together until I started going through it uh, myself, but so for me, it was never, um, it was never a thought that I couldn't be I couldn't fulfill a dream that I wanted to fulfill um, because I had already seen my dad doing it. And once uh, I was under the understanding that he was dealing with the same thing I was with asthma, um, it was never a thought. But I'm fortunate in that way that I had a, a father that was dealing with it and was also a major league baseball player. Not everyone uh, is fortunate enough to have that. The Lung Association, as you guys know, has a free online programs like asthma basics and support groups that help families improve their lung health. And for me, after participating in my first ever lung force, lung force walk, uh, the nation's most successful walk, uh, I was inspired. I wanted to, I wanted to find a way um, to be more involved, to be more helpful. Um, unfortunately, then COVID-19 hit, M not even, I think, a month later. Um, social injustice soared. And you know, I found myself as I found myself really wondering how I could be of help, how I could uh, really make an impact. So um, uh, on on the on our board, every week, every month, we ask ourselves many questions: um, How can we do more to reach all communities, our communities of color, and our most at-risk communities here in San Diego? And you know, health equity is at our organization's core. And um, our belief is that everyone should have the same chance at healthy uh, lungs and, and even clean air. I mean, that sounds crazy, but uh, it's, not, um, it's not a foregone conclusion for, for, for some folks. But uh, as I said, too often those families with the most to lose get the least access to quality health care and the finest hospitals and even, as I said, uh, clean air. The, the injustices and social unrest that emerged around us compelled the American Lung Association to reflect on what we can do to embed diversity, um, uh, equity, and inclusion fully and, and genuinely within the organization and the communities we serve. Um, while the Lung Association for many years has addressed health equity at, at all levels of government, today the entire organization from top to our furthest reaches has the support of our nationwide DEI Council. And, and over the last year, <clears throat> excuse me, with the council support um, and the support of, the, of our national leadership, much groundwork has been laid to become um, a more uh, diverse, equitable, uh, and, and inclusive. Um, I, I'm proud of this work, along with my fellow board and, and committee members. We will ensure we speak to and address the unique needs of all population with an understanding of uh, disproportionate impact of systematic racism and and social injustice on our health in, in certain communities. Uh, Community Connections in San Diego is a program with the idea of reaching all of our communities here in San Diego. Um, it's free educational talks uh, with some of the best physicians uh, here in San Diego. Uh, my fellow board member, Dr. Tim Morris, likes to call it dinner with docs. So uh, again, I wanna thank everyone uh, for being here. It's great getting together today. And with that being said, I will hand it off. I got to get back to the radio show to Dr. Morris and I uh, hope you guys uh, get a chance to enjoy it. Thank you very much, Tony. That, that, that's really inspiring. I have to say you're inspiring on many different levels. And one of them is, is accomplishing so much as a person with lung disease and, and uh, sort of not letting it stop you. And that's, that's really one of the uh, big uh, points of, of the Lung Association is to say that the lung disease doesn't need to stop you. And congratulations that it didn't. 
Uh, and the other thing that's really inspiring, I, I, I haven't heard, heard that story before, that you're, uh, you decided to do something about it, that you decided to give back. And, and uh, you have inspired a lot of us to try to give back as well. So thank you very much for your participation and you've been instrumental in what we do. Thank you. Well, uh, so uh, those of you who tuned in to see our, our session today, let me introduce uh, myself. My name is Tim Morris, and I am the uh, chair of what is called the Mission Committee in the Lung Association. And the Mission Committee is uh, composed of uh, uh, medical professionals and healthcare professionals and environmental professionals and government uh, 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 experts uh, from a, a variety of different backgrounds who all got together on their own time and decided to help the Lung Association to uh, uh, explore its mission, uh, to find ways that it can devote its resources to maximize the benefit to you, the, uh, the public, and also to help them execute whatever it is uh, that they decided they were going to do. Uh, tonight, uh, um, we're going to uh, give the final session in a series that the Mission Committee uh, came up with called the Community Connection Series. And, and if you go onto YouTube, go onto our, uh, our um, webpage, they'll get, take you to some YouTube links and you can see any of the previous 14 hours of lectures that uh, experts from around the, the uh, city and county have uh, volunteered their time to give. Um, now, community Connections uh, is made possible by a grant from the Burhart and Lung Clinic at Sharp Grossmont Hospital, as well as the San Diego Foundation. Uh, but tonight, we have a special treat for you, one of our most popular um, uh, presentations uh, from spring of this year. Uh, the, the presenters have generously uh, agreed to come back and give another version of it. And it's my pleasure to introduce my two good friends, Dr. Uh, Nichang Liang and Dr. Sabrina Falkier, uh, um, Monkrain, uh, who are going to talk with us about um, nutrition and mindfulness and lung health. And I did pronounce both of their names correctly this time. Dr. I believe, Dr. Falkia, you are going to uh, start, correct? I am. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Morris. I really appreciate this opportunity and uh, to do a, a comeback. And Dr. Liang and I um, discuss whether we do a one, uh, you know, our, our one hit wonder again or add some variety. We decided to add a little variety. And I love what uh, Mr. Gwen said about, well, not love, it's not happy stuff, but that sense and that awareness that depending on our zip code, sometimes there can be a 30 year difference in life expectancy just from what our zip code is. And it's just so impactful to have that awareness that you don't, you're born into your zip code, you know, your, your parents or, or we make a decision or sometimes it's out of our hands where we live and the impact that that can have on our health. So knowing that there are all these aspects that are really outside of our control, um, what I really want to focus on is, and it's going to go right into what Dr. Liang is going to talk about, really these, these pillars of wellness that we can focus on. So with COVID still happening, with lung, um, lungs especially being affected, not just during COVID, but the aftermath of COVID, let alone all the, uh, all the chronic lung diseases from asthma. I mean, I don't have to list them with this audience, but really keeping in mind, what can I do personally um, for my health on a day-to-day -day that can really help move that needle to keep me grounded, to help my immune system be the strongest and to help fight whatever disease I'm currently fighting. So those pillars of wellness are number one food and my area of specialty is culinary medicine. So really using food to optimize your health sometimes to re return to health, sometimes to prevent disease altogether. So really focusing on the food choices that we're making. The second one is exercise. So make sure that we're moving our body. And that doesn't mean we have to get sporty spice clothes and go to the gym every day for 45 minutes or two hours, really just getting out and walking between meetings or uh, you know, between when we leave work and get in the car, kind of transition between parts of our day. It's a nice way to give a pause. With the goal of 30 minutes most days of the week of movement and two days a week of some, um, I'm laughing at <laughs> what Dr. Crotty Alexander put. Don't make me laugh, Dr. Crotty. <laughs> uh, yes, sporty spice is really important, but you can choose sporty spice, don't get me wrong. And I'm telling you, and I think my husband's on this, so watch out because I'm going to be one of those old ladies that's going to wear the three dimensional swim caps when I'm older. So watch it. Um, all right. So exercise, so 30 minutes most is the week, and then two days a week of making sure that you're doing some strength training. And again, that could be planks, that could be wall push ups, really simple. The next one is sleep. So honoring how much, how much sleep our body needs. Most people need between seven and nine hours and not to 
shortchange it because it really affects our body in the long term, even the next day, what we choose to eat, how patient we are with our patients or with our loved ones or even with ourselves. The next one is relationships, so connections and really knowing who really fills our bucket and what things do not fill our bucket. So there could be certain relationships, like with the holidays coming up, there may be some interactions that we have to have that may not fill our bucket as much, but try to really balance those things out of, again, taking a walk after spending five hours with our loved ones, um, you know, maybe watching a sport that you may not love as much as other people, but take, giving yourself that breathing space. And then also, again, that yin yang of connection, disconnection. And uh, for example, a lot of times social media, some people feel like it's their way to disconnect and unwind, but sometimes it can really um, affect our, our bucket. So instead of feeling full afterwards, we feel even more drained. And then the last one is mindfulness. And Dr. Liang is gonna go into this a lot more, but that sense of doing something that is really when we're in the moment, um, and that could be cooking, um, it could be chopping vegetables, it could be listening to music. And bringing it back um, to that sense of what, what should I eat? Um, I've been getting, um, since I pulled away actually from primary care over the last few months, even in the last week, I've gotten inquiries from people really trying to find out what can they do? They just got a new illness, like chronic renal disease, somebody with a, a new pulmonary nodule, um, somebody who overall just wants to improve their health. What can they do to move that needle? And there's a really simple visual of many of you have seen this either yourselves ah, we might there we go we're out of the foliage by the way that is passion fruit fine behind me but essentially really thinking about filling up half your plate with fruits and vegetables a quarter plate with whole grains and a quarter plate with well thought out proteins and that visual of saying what can i do to add more perhaps of those vegetables and fruits as the holidays are coming up it's like roasting vegetables that can go along with the things that we think of regular Thanksgiving, things that have a little bit more fiber than perhaps the um, mashed potatoes that, um, you know, everything kind of, a lot of the food is kind of like acts like glue in our intestines. And the nice thing about Thanksgiving is a lot more people usually cook for Thanksgiving than for other meals. It's actually Thanksgiving and Valentine's are two of the holidays where more people cook at home than any other time of the year. And that's a beautiful thing to see. And even that, if someone's home cooking, the already the nutritional content and the salt content is going to go way down. But that sense of what can you do to reduce the amount of processed food? So there's actually culinary medicine studies that look at COPD, for example. And for that one is actually a lot of the nitrates that we see in especially processed meats that really affect COPD outcomes. And so that, that realization of even if it may be something that I personally love, but I now have this diagnosis of COPD, perhaps I can find other alternatives. So not saying, okay, you know, if you've always been a, a processed meat eater for your whole life, it's going to be really difficult to take it away altogether but knowing and having that awareness of what can I do to move that needle towards adding more unprocessed food. And that's really the goal. Uh, Michael Pollan, who is, uh, he works out of Berkeley, he's written many books and he has, there's a few movies. Uh, he has a seven, let, a seven word quote that really would be beautiful if we could all follow it of eat real food, not too much, mostly plants. And if you just pause and think about the words and I'm gonna repeat it again, eat real food, not too much, mostly plants. If we all ate that way, it's of course easier said than done, but thinking about that, especially as we head into the holidays, we talk about there's all this pressure cooker that comes in. And, and last year it was interesting because we didn't have the choice of gathering like we did. A lot of people describe that they felt a lot more at peace in a lot of ways because there was a lot of less tug and pull of kind of the, the plays at the kids' schools or you know holiday parties family gatherings, all these activities that, that really were minimized. This year is a little bit different. COVID hasn't gone away, but there, is, there are things opening up. But continually check in with yourself. Do I want to go to this party? Do I need to go to this party? Do I, can I think of things I can eat to kind of nurture my body and my soul as I'm doing these pieces, especially now that it's so much darker out, there's this kind of sense of half of us feel like it's midnight at 7 p.m. and honoring, okay, you know what, this is a bit of a time of wanting to hibernate and, and taking that into account and being careful not to keep drinking caffeine really late at night or a lot of alcohol, um, you know, that kind of come with the holidays. So 
the take home, I know we're really short on time, but really the take home I want you to just think about is pausing and thinking about those five pillars. And I'm just going to repeat them again one more time. So one is the food that we're eating. Two is, are we moving our body? Number three is how much sleep our body needs. Number four is connection. And the yang of that is disconnection that we may need. And then also mindfulness. So with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to Dr. Liang, who's going to run with the mindfulness component. Thanks so much, Dr. Falke Montgrain. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to speak again on one of my favorite topics to speak about, and that's mindfulness. So the definition of mindfulness formally is paying attention on purpose to the present moment without judgment. But that's kind of a lot. And so I like to simplify that. And really what mindfulness boils down to is how can we get our minds and our physical bodies in the same place at the same time? And there have been over 9,000 studies published in the medical literature about the use of mindfulness for stress reduction, for reducing anxiety, depression, and also a lot of different chronic diseases like COPD, asthma, insomnia, even for smoking cessation, addiction medicine, and others, too numerous to name. Um, and how do we practice mindfulness? So you can actually practice mindfulness by simply paying attention to your feet. That is probably the easiest way that you can get into the present moment experience, asking yourself, where are my feet? And simply noticing that aspect of your present moment experience. Um, so how does mindfulness work? People can increase their ability to be mindful by formally practicing it with different exercises. But you can actually practice mindfulness anytime, anywhere, doing anything or not doing anything at all by simply paying attention to what you're doing without judgment. So Dr. Falke Mongrain mentioned that you can be mindful when you're chopping vegetables. So as you're preparing these holiday meals and as you're gathering and as you're eating, these are all opportunities for you to pause and simply notice your current experience of what's happening in your life. For instance, if you're chopping vegetables, noticing the texture of the vegetable, noticing the colors of the vegetables. Are you able to name like the temperature of the vegetable that you happen to be cutting? Is it cold having just come out of the refrigerator or room temperature because it's been sitting in a bowl uh, displayed on your kitchen counter, for instance? So a formal way to practice mindfulness that can increase your ability to be mindful in the moment is simply paying attention to your breath. And we'll go into a couple of different breath practices in a couple of minutes that I will share with all of you and that you are more than welcome to join us in trying. But usually there's a focus of attention. Oftentimes it's the breath. You notice the breath and inevitably because our human minds were made to wander and help look for dangers, our minds are gonna wander. We simply acknowledge the mind wandering and we bring our attention back to our focus of attention, oftentimes the breath. And then you observe this happening over and over again. And every time you notice that your mind has wandered to something besides your focus of attention is a moment of mindfulness and you can bring it back to that particular focus of attention over and over again. And so what that does is it creates something called neuroplasticity or basically our brains are capable of rewiring in ways that are beneficial for us and in ways that are beneficial for us to respond to stress in healthier ways as opposed to how we were wired with when we were born. So for instance, human beings naturally will hold on to and will ruminate and perseverate and hold on to things that are more negative in nature. And this is evolutionarily advantageous because our ancestors in the prehistoric age needed to be on high alert to look out for any predators that would physically eat them. But now in the 21st century, luckily we don't have any physical predators that would eat us. However, our minds, our brains are still set up to respond to stress in much the same way, the fight or fight or freeze response. And in the 21st century, that reaction 
those reactions are no longer needed and are not serving us in healthy ways because if we endure chronic stress and we have this constant fight, flight, or freeze response that's going on, that can actually lead to a lot of different chronic diseases such as high blood pressure, stroke, heart disease, just to name a few, even diabetes, influence on cancer, and then worsening of asthma, for instance, and triggering of various worsening of lung diseases. So it's really important to have this framework of stress and having the ability to respond to stress in a healthier way to become empowered. So with regards to that, I'll lead you in a couple of different breathing exercises that can help you optimize and start training you to become more mindful. So these breathing exercises you can do in the moment of any sort of stress, difficulty, discomfort, pain, for instance. Uh, and also, I invite you to try it when you are noticing any shortness of breath for those of you in the audience who have any chronic lung disease. So I'll teach you four different types of breathing practices. The most uh, close to pulmonary rehabilitation because it's actually taught in pulmonary rehabilitation is pursed lip breathing. So you simply make sure you're sitting upright. Oftentimes in the day and age of the pandemic, we are slumped over in front of our computers. We're Zooming, we're doing electronic work many, many hours of the day. And oftentimes we forget that even just sitting upright where we can put our lungs in an anatomically advantageous position to enable the lungs to do what they were meant to do can be really, really an easy thing to feel better. So sitting upright, making sure that our head is atop our neck, atop our shoulders, atop our hips. We can take a deep breath through our nose, inhaling all the way, and then blowing out through your mouth like you're blowing out birthday candles. So you can do that exhale two to four times longer than your inhale and by prolonging that exhale you remove the stagnant air and also you help stent open the airways so this type of breathing practice this purse lip breathing is really great for people who have obstructive lung disease like asthma and copd but really it can be helpful for anyone with any sort of chronic lung disease or if you don't have chronic lung disease at all so we'll do that one more time in through the nose inhaling and then blowing out birthday candles through the mouth, really prolonging that exhale two to four times longer than the inhale. And then the next one that I'm gonna teach is actually taught in Navy SEALs. So this type of breathing practice is called box breathing. And box breathing can be used for situations where you're about to do something kind of stressful. Um, it's helpful for people who might have a little bit of performance anxiety, or where you need to really increase your focus to perform at a higher level. And so box breathing is kind of exactly what it sounds like. So you inhale through your nose for four counts, two, three, four, and you hold for four counts, two, three, four, and then you exhale for four counts, two, three, four, and you hold that exhale for four counts, two, three, four, and then you inhale again, so it forms a box. So you're inhaling for four, holding for four, exhaling for four, and holding that exhale for four. And then the last type of breath practice that can help you increase mindfulness uh, is called the four, seven, eight breath. So this is taught by Dr. Andrew Weil, who is the grandfather of integrative medicine. And this is a type of breath that also has been shown to upregulate our rest and digest nervous system, which is the parasympathetic nervous system. And so how we do this type of breathing is you inhale through your nose for four counts, two, three, four, and then you hold for seven, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then you exhale through your mouth for eight, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then you inhale again for four. You pause for seven, and you exhale through your mouth again for eight. So 
that type of breath practice is similar to the pursed lips breathing, but you have that long pause of seven. Um, I find that for my patients who have asthma or COPD, that the pursed lip breath is a little bit easier to do. But for those of us who don't have chronic lung disease, then the four, seven, eight breath might be something that you can access and that might um, upregulate your parasympathetic nervous system even faster. And so I wouldn't recommend that you do these breath practices over and over and over again. Probably picking one that works for you in the moment and doing three to five breath cycles, and that's it. Because otherwise, you might get really dizzy because you're blowing down your CO2 levels, and that could make you um, a little lightheaded. So other ways that you can practice mindfulness, especially during the holiday season, is through mindful eating. So you can simply savor your bite of food with all of your senses, noticing the textures, the taste, the colors, the smell, even the sounds that the food makes are all different ways that you can incorporate mindfulness into eating. You can also put down your utensils between your bites to really slow down how fast we eat. And you can even use your non-dominant hand to eat your meal. And you can notice how challenging that might be and how much more you will pay attention to how you're eating in that respect. But we know that mindful eating has been shown to curb our cravings. It decreases portion sizes and can contribute to healthy weight loss. So I urge all of you to try mindful eating at the very least, perhaps one of these breathing practices, um, but also remembering that you can practice mindfulness simply by noticing what's happening to you in the moment without any judgment. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about mindfulness. And I thank the American Lung Association for putting this wonderful program on. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Lane. That was great. I just want to add one more thing. I know our time is up. This was a speedy, speedy moment. Is in primary care, I actually use that box breathing when patients come in with uh, white coat hypertension. So they come in and they're they're blood pressure is high, but they say at home it's a lot lower. And we'll do that four times. So essentially I call it the rule of four. So we do the same idea. And the, the blood pressure will go down 20 points, which is amazing. And, and to see somebody see immediate changes like that is very motivating. And not that I want them to get a blood pressure cuff unless I need it at home, but just for them to see it right in front of them, that effect of slowing down and just focusing on one thing of that mindfulness that really can affect the body very, very quickly. Yeah, thanks Thank for you. highlighting that, Dr. Falke and Mongrain. Um, we can use breath practice and be mindful about it as a way to empower our own use of our own physiology. So we can take advantage of the miraculous body that we all have and upregulate our rest and digest nervous system to bring about healthy changes like that, like a drop in blood pressure. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. This was a pleasure to interact with you again. I do hope we get to do it again in person one of these days. <laughs> I hope so too. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Falkier Monkrain and Dr. Liang. Uh, this was great. And, and uh, certainly if we do this session again, I think you guys are going to be the showcase of the session. It's certainly the, one of the more popular sessions that we do. Uh, as you know, um, it is our habit to have uh, the, all the members of the uh, mission committee join us at the end of, your, of the talk and, and entertain any comments or questions. So I'll leave that open uh, to uh, one of the members of the, of the committee who is on the line and uh, certainly have a question if, if uh, they don't. Well, let me ask my question then. So um, what would you um, suggest for people that want to know more about this? This is really fascinating. I have to say my comment uh, uh, before I answer that question is that this is really refreshing that, that we have two, who, uh, two expertly trained doctors who certainly know all of the physiology and pathophysiology and, and uh, the things that go into what we normally consider treatments uh, for patients who are focusing on this aspect of, of, uh, of treatment. But I'm wondering uh, for people who are not your patients uh, who are listening in, what would they what would you suggest they do to find out more about what you're talking about? 
I'll start here. So one of the ways that you can see the impacts of food, I'm, to I'm totally going to plug the a documentary I'm a part of right here, Dr. Morris, you just you totally set me up for that. But one of the, um, I'm actually a part of a documentary not, right now that's called The Kitchenistas. So save the date. Don't make any other party plans over December except this one. <laughs> But uh, December 8th, we're actually, the movie's actually being shown at the IMAX at the theater, um, which is pretty exciting. And it's open to the public. It's at 5.45 p.m. Uh, children and adult are welcome. And what I love about it is that it really shows the power of food. So it shows this culinary medicine and ideal scenario. You have a several week session where every week you're learning about different aspects about food. Like we talked about that plate, learning about roasting and vegetables and the play, role they play and how to how to cook, not just why you should cook healthy, but how to do it. And also uh, really the empowerment about community, Latina empowerment as it takes place in Olive Wood Gardens near, um, near the border. We're slowly bringing it into medical schools. I'm actually working with a few medical schools now across the country and even down south of the border. Um, so it's making its way in and we're starting to have some community classes through the culinary med medicine specialist board that's international. So uh, if you are interested, culinarymedicine.org is a great place to look further into that. Great. I have to tell you that you've, you've made me up my game after listening to you. I, I, I'm a, I apologize to the impact I've had on the cheeseburger economy, uh, but, uh, but I'm doing a lot more vegetables and, and uh, fruits now that you're listening to what you have to say. <laughs> Good. Well, Dr. Morris, if you get in touch with me today, I did a class with medical students in Ensenada and we took, we did a hidden veggie burger that we're going to actually have for dinner tonight. So you can ask one of your colleagues what, what you think of it. Very good. Uh, Dr. Uh, Wong, I believe I saw you were um, on the line. Did you have a question? Um, yeah, well, I, first of all, I just wanted to thank both Dr. Falke and Montgomery and Dr. Liang. I mean, it's always a pleasure to, to see you um, both because what I think your work that you're doing is so critical. I think not just for the health of our patients, but the health of our profession. I think for too long, you know, we focused on just trying to undo damage rather than trying to prevent the damage. And, you know, um, but um, in terms of specific questions, you know, I think what I, sometimes for my patients, they, they literally, you know, I'm, I'm trying to counsel them about, you know, the five pillars and, and it's just so overwhelming, right? So I wonder if you guys, um, either of you have any suggestions then about like, you know, introducing these topics like over time and, and how to, because, how do you really get people to affect change, right? How do you how do you undo a lifetime of habits? <laughs> I'll take this one. Thanks, Angela, for that question. So habit formation is all about the way that our brains have been conditionally wired by a multitude of different reasons. And to combat habits to influence change comes intention. So intentional change, and I would highly recommend just focusing on like one pillar of health at a time and consistently doing something called tikas or tiny imperfect consistent action as a mnemonic from the coaching world. So if you participate in tiny imperfect consistent actions every day towards that pillar of health, then it's more likely that you're going to be moving the needle on influencing and increasing your prioritization of the pillars of health. And with regards to mindfulness, um, I think it relates to Dr. Fuster's question that he popped in the chat box here about, um, he feels that being mindful to remember to be mindful can be a challenge. <laughs> and he puts in the chat box, maybe setting a regular phone reminder but it's challenging. <laughs> so I would say that let life and all of the stressful events and discomfort, um, whether it be pain or anxiety or just difficult situations, let that be opportunities to practice mindfulness. If there's difficulty, how can we treat ourselves as if we were treating a loved one? Oftentimes we forget to do that and that a uh, moment of difficulty in life, especially with everything that we've gone through through the pandemic, can be an opportunity to practice mindfulness. 
to ground back into what we're experiencing right here and now, simply going through and naming our emotions that we're having at that time. So naming emotions to tame the emotions. And we know that that disarms the amygdala from being activated to go into fight or flight. We, if we name it, we can disarm that. Um, and we can allow body sensations to be, can, we can notice the body sensations and feel into the emotion. So in psychology, there's an adage of feel to heal. So giving ourselves permission to actually feel difficult emotions in the moment, not trying to suppress them or resist or deny them, which um, is oftentimes what we are habituated to do. Um, so those are some ways to, to use challenging situations to practice mindfulness and hopefully to be able to um, change habits for the better. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lane, Dr. Falke, uh, Monkrain. That was a fabulous talk, and, and I think we could probably uh, continue all night uh, uh, asking you questions and hearing your wonderful responses, but uh, we do need to move on with our meeting. Thank you very much uh, for your presentations. Uh, let me take now this opportunity to introduce uh, the, uh, the chair of our board, uh, Ms. Jenny Reynolds, who will introduce the rest of the meeting. Jenny?